The internet has evolved greatly over the years, constantly changing and adapting with current trends and culture. Also becoming accessible in many different ways, from the sad PC setup you call a battle rig to the mobile device that you touch with all five little piggies in finger form. But the internet has evolved so much that it's become a second home to almost everyone, even mainstream consumers due to COVID destroying everyone's social lives and while we're at it, bank accounts. The internet has given people friends, jobs, stress, social isolation, addiction, codependency, sadness, sleep deprivation, insomnia. But what I find most interesting is that the internet has given some of us parasocial relationships, and they aren't as bad as you might think they are. By just the title of the video alone, some of you might already have your minds concluded and are rushing into the comment section typing about how wrong I am and that Dream is making a cult army. You're right, but just watch the video. Parasocial relationships are a huge taboo and open discussion since most points against it tend to be parroted without much elaboration. And on the opposite side, you have those who ride the fence looking at both the negatives and positives. And while I might come off as noble to the average enjoyer who will clap their hands and give a shiny medal, I find it safe and lazy. Everything in the world has negatives and positives when you point them out. And to use that as a justification to not be critical and choose a side is actually quite cowardly in comparison to just stating that you don't care about the discussion or that you simply don't want to piss anyone off. I don't care about US politics and when anyone asks my opinions on the subjects, I don't ride the fence to make myself look open-minded. I just state that I'm too uninvested, uninterested, and uneducated to give an opinion on the matter. And when I watch a shitty movie with a group of friends and someone asks what I thought at the end of it, I just say it was good and carry on because I'm not going to debate people in my day-to-day -day life who only watch the movie to get a two-hour escape from reality. God, Black Widow fucking sucks. I'm not saying that you can't be open-minded, I stand by the complete opposite it actually, but fence sitting is starting to become too prevalent in discussions that tend to have disagreements. For those confused in our goblins who fight on Twitter all day, fence sitting is a state of indecision or neutrality with respects to conflicting positions. So if you own an apple and I steal it because I'm hungry, the majority opinion would be that I'm acting like an asshole because I just stole an apple from you. But the fence sitter would find justification in my actions and remain neutral when I'm clearly in the wrong. And where it's good to be open-minded, like looking for my motives and reasoning for stealing the apple, it should give more context to make a conclusive decision. If the answer is clear and you're still fence sitting, it's most likely because you want to be a part of the conversation, but don't want to pick a definitive side to avoid backlash. I'm being extremely transparent because I am not fence sitting in this video. The title reads, A Defense of Parasocial Relationships, and I stand by the take that parasocial relationships are okay and to an extent even needed. But I'm also going to be critical on both sides of the relationship. But my viewpoint is concrete and final. Parasocial relationships are okay and to an extent even needed. Now that I got that mouthful out of the way, parasocial relationships are something I find super fascinating. A parasocial interaction refers to a kind of psychological relationship experienced by an audience in their meditated encounters with performers in the mass media, particularly on television. Viewers or listeners come to consider media personalities as friends despite having no or limited interactions with them. That was the definition, but I'll give you the English version. Piss off, GLaDOS. An example of a parasocial interaction is having engagement or emotional feelings with media that has no connection to you, making it completely one-sided. This applies to both fiction and non-fiction. This is just the general concept with no context to positive or negative examples. But recent events and online personalities have tainted people's perspectives on the concept of a parasocial relationship. So I made a poll on Twitter to get feedback on just the main concept alone. I asked if a parasocial relationship was okay, and 73.6 of 106 votes said no, while 26.4 said yes. And I wasn't surprised at all. They aren't okay. Being so obsessed with a creator or community of creators isn't really healthy. I don't think getting obsessed with someone on the internet that you do not know IRL is a good thing. It sounds unhealthy. It will probably lead to disappointment either way if you ever meet them IRL. No, I think they're unhealthy as fuck. The main criticism I read about parasocial relationships is that they're unhealthy due to them being one-sided and not real. Look up to IRL people you know, friends, family, etc. Not YouTubers. That's your first mistake. Myself included. Stop idolizing YouTubers. I'll keep preaching this to the end of time, even against myself. It's a really bad take. I made a joke response saying that my father killed 83 people and that my best friend killed a batch of baby birds. And while it's clearly a joke, unless they're doing some shit in private, it applies to my disagreement. Remember, we're not talking about the negatives of a parasocial relationship yet. We're talking about the general concept. There's nothing wrong with having one-way relationships in regards to media. If you're watching a show and like the main character while worrying for their well-being, you have formed a parasocial relationship. You clearly understand that Walter White and Iron Man aren't real people, yet you still have attachment to the character and sometimes the actors who betray them. But let's apply this to media that involves real people. It's kind of the same, but it isn't. Nice writing, ass face. If I hate Breaking Bad, I can't attack Walter White because he's not real, but I can still harass and annoy the writer Vince Gilligan or the actor who portrayed him. 
<laughs> just kidding, Brian Cranston, I would never. But if I don't like PewDiePie and I choose to be a nuisance, I'm affecting PewDiePie directly since he's a real person. Fictional parasocial relationships and real parasocial relationships both share the same positives and negatives. For example, Game of Thrones season eight was so poor that when it concluded, the writers started receiving hate and death threats. Even though the show was fictional, the audience understands that the show didn't come out of thin air. There's a team behind it, but nonetheless, something that's based around fiction can still have fans that cross boundaries. There is an exclusivity to shitty behavior, just as there is an exclusivity to good behavior of a parasocial relationship. This tweet makes no sense because it's situational and extremely subjective. Just because you know someone in your day-to-day -day life shouldn't give them priority over the impact of parasocial relationships. If a child adores Spider-Man and Markiplier but has a drunk, abusive father, in what logical sense should the father have priority over the content they're consuming? Look, I know this is a dark example, but even in a lighter context, it still makes no sense. If your mother works at a gas station and is a good person but has nothing in common with your ambitions, dreams, or goals, why should they have priority over a role model that could potentially be more relatable and inspirational. I, of course, love my family, but they weren't my role models growing up. This isn't a jab, they just generally weren't. Those were my parasocial relationships. I love filmmaking and wanted to follow the same path as the directors I grew up watching. I also love music and overcame a lot of obstacles because of the artists that I now deem my heroes. <laughs> Thanks, Cuddy. And today I'm pretty confident that James Gunn, director of Guardians of the Galaxy, and Kid Cuddy have no clue who the hell I am, but nonetheless, I have that parasocial relationship because both have impacted my life direction. And since I'm a YouTuber, it's fair to say that I have a lot of other YouTubers that I grew up watching that led me to the path that I'm at now. And I've been pretty vocal about it. Also, Shammy is one of the main reasons why I write the way I do. Also, saying that I make YouTube videos, I should also mention probably some of the YouTubers who I get influenced by. When I was a kid, I watched Zaptai, and this was a video that I made six months ago where I explained the power of influence and I mentioned the content creators who influence. Me. I'm now fortunate enough today to have contact with some of these people, but at some point it was just completely one-sided, with me being the viewer and them being the entertainer. It's surprising how many people are in agreement with this post, and I'm pretty sure that most, if not all, are hypocrites and have made their own parasocial relationships at one point with content creators. Idolizing celebrities can set you up for disappointment but so can family and relatives. People can be shitty role models, from your parents to your favorite content creators. There's nothing wrong with looking up to celebrities. And in this context, that includes YouTube content creators. YouTubers are no different than actors, musicians, athletes, or anybody that has a public platform for that matter. But something I find weird is that music and sports seem to be the only forms of entertainment that don't have a problem with idolization and parasocial relationships. At least when compared to other examples, that is. I looked up to like MIA and Kid Cudi, man. Kid Cudi's like, really like one of the main dudes I kind of like looked at and listened to all the time. He saved my life. He saved me from doing like random bad things to myself, kept me like focused. Like Most rap musicians, yes, Ben Shapiro, musicians, will admit that they listen and praise Kanye West, Jay-Z, Biggie Smalls, or any other rapper that they grew up listening to that led them to pursue their career. And for athletics, let's use basketball for example. Both Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan grew up attempting to fill in the shoes of past NBA legends that they admired. And today, Michael Jordan is still a huge inspiration for future and current NBA players. But he had a horrible gambling addiction which doesn't make him a perfect role model on paper. Yet people still want to be like Mike. And back to the music example, Kanye has had a shit ton of incidents that could be debated, yet he's still referred to as one of the greatest musicians of all time. Both are cases of parasocial relationships with inspiration having flaws, and exempting YouTube personalities from idolization because of failure to meet expectations is unfair. YouTubers aren't exclusive to not meeting expectations and like everyone should be held accountable if necessary, but gatekeeping them from idolization in general is ridiculous. Vulnerability in media is something that leads to parasocial relationships but can sometimes be unintentionally impactful. And the place you could find this most prevalent would be music and film. If an artist displays something that's thought-provoking or relatable, this could lead to the consumer developing deep emotions to the artist and their work. There's no problem with this. And most of the time, it's even intentional from the artist to have the consumer feel something. Most musicians admit that the songs they make are up for the listener's interpretation, and whatever they settle with in their mind is theirs exclusively. This also applies to films, especially psychological ones like The Lighthouse, Shutter Island, the Truman Show, Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, or anything Charlie Kaufman. You can find the artist's intentional vision behind a project most of the time, but whatever the consumer feels about the art is completely subjective to them. This is an example of a parasocial relationship that's not problematic at all. And if you were to love the art and the artist for what they're making, that's okay as well. Everyone tends to get low, and that could be from life events and shitty circumstances, and when people are at their most vulnerable, they cling on closely to whatever helps them. You all have that favorite song where the artist hits all the notes that you might be feeling, making you love the song because it's so relatable. I know this because I've used my favorite sad song as my outro for almost every video. The song is by Brockhampton and is named Feel. And the person singing is named Joba, and he has a discussion with his brain who's relapsing on the wrong decisions he's made, while the person in the mirror is persuading him to end his life. 
but he's then disrupted by another band member who gives him reassurance that he blends in with the guys. I use this example because it's really personal and subjective to me, but everyone has something they latch onto in a state of vulnerability. It could be a show, a video game, or even a song. There's creative people that I love without having any connection to them because of how much their heart has impacted me in a vulnerable state. And I understand that it's one-sided, so there's no problem with me having these feelings in a parasocial relationship. Everything in the world has positives and negatives, and parasocial relationships aren't exempt from this. A viewer can at times cross a line intentionally and unintentionally, and it's important to not do that. People need to know their boundaries when engaging with someone they have formed a parasocial relationship with. And it's also the responsibility of the subject to not abuse the power dynamic. Look, I've been that annoying little kid before, so I understand awkward interactions with people you adore, especially since there's so many different ways a creator can establish contact with fans nowadays. There's a couple creators who enable their fandom like KSI because he doesn't give a shit and it makes for good content, but this doesn't apply to everyone. And sometimes the way you talk to a creator will weird them the fuck out. A friend can make fun of me and throw around my first name because we're tight like that, but if the same is done by someone I've never Ever met before, the same feeling doesn't apply and I'm going to be weirded out. This is the same with one-sided humor. This was a response from a content creator named Shammy to a fan who was self-advertising and he's completely in the right. Even though you know the personality of someone you watch, they don't know anything about you and will judge you based on first impression. There's ways to stand out and make contact with someone you idolize without coming off as annoying and intrusive. And for creators, don't take what you have for granted. Power dynamics exist and people will have obsessions over you. And it's responsible for you to shut down those dynamics when you can. If you're an adult and a teenage fan is pursuing you, you are at a majority fault if you pursue any further. Yes, the fan is still at fault, but not in nearly as much as the creator due to them not taking the responsible route of shutting down the situation. Don't take what you have for granted. It's ridiculous to gamble on power dynamics. Be responsible. Toxicity is the main reason that parasocial relationships are looked down upon and I understand why. Toxicity is apparent in every community, but is extremely problematic when it comes to parasocial relationships of certain content creators. And it's not just the fans' fault, it's also the subjects who are enabling it. In this context, it would be the content creator. It could range from scumbags like Maximilianus encouraging toxic fans to harass and dox people, or Minecraft creators who let their fan base step all over them without setting boundaries. If you own a Star Wars channel and don't like the Rise of Skywalker, that's perfectly fine. But if you send your toxic fan base to send death threats to the cast and production, that's incredibly immature and toxic. If you have the privilege of a fan base and use them for harm, you're not deserving of it. But to the second point, creators need to have a fucking spine. Your relationship to the creator is subjective and should have no influence. You don't know the person and don't have any input to their life or who they associate with. If a creator associates with someone that you don't like, suck it up and deal with it or fuck off and go away. Making someone trend over minuscule reasons is an abusive power dynamic, and it's usually the creator's fault for not combating or defending themselves because they don't want to piss off their money bag. You constantly see these spineless dweebs fold and apologize over dumb shit and it gives their fan base confidence that if they complain enough, they will get their way. It's unhealthy and incredibly concerning. Then you have people like Fitz, Jay Schlatt, and Connor Eats Pants who double down and don't fold because letting 13 year old kids make decisions for you is stupid. Stay in culture is the most toxic form of a parasocial relationship because it's extremely obsessive. If your whole world revolves around someone that you don't know, that's not normal and should not be encouraged. There's a difference between interest and obsession. I am inspired and motivated by my parasocial relationships, but I don't make my world axes around them because that's fucking weird. You can like Dream and have him be a source of your enjoyment, but if you argue with those who don't carry those same views or even Dream himself for having an opinion or doing something that you dislike, that is unhealthy. And Dream enabling this behavior is irresponsible. At the end of the day, a parasocial relationship isn't that impactful on children because most stands are kids who will grow out of it. All the girls back in the day who would have jumped on a spike for each member of One Direction are grown as adults now. But encouraging this behavior is impactful to everyone that surrounds this cult-like following and sets a bad standard that the fan has control over the creator. No no one should be a dancing monkey to their audience. The entertainer doesn't know you or love you, and if they say they love you, that's because they want you to buy their merch. Have a spine, put your foot down, and stop enabling a cult. With everything being said, parasocial relationships are more than just stan culture. Everyone has these relationships and it's okay to take part in them if you're at the understanding that it's one-sided. It's never okay to hold up individuals as gods amongst men because we're all human and we'll let you down at some point. But it's still okay to have media that can inspire you or even lead you to a path that you want to take in the future. Just remember, the TV doesn't love you and it's not obligated to. An obsession over anything from drugs to junk food is problematic and unhealthy. Be responsible with your parasocial relationships and remain realistic. At the end of the day, we're all just people. I see our boys tomorrow. We bring them live out. We bring them live out. Fuck around, leave your child out. Leave your child out. Hey, we bring them.